This is the first of a two-part video series on technical tips and tricks for ultrasound-guided peripheral nerve blocks. The technical performance of ultrasound-guided peripheral nerve blocks is something of great interest to me. I consider it not just a skill, but also an art, and I personally take great pleasure in executing a block well. More importantly though, good technique also increases the probability that the block will be both safe and effective. Technical mastery will allow you to place your local anesthetic into an optimal location at the lowest possible dose and with the least trauma to the patient. In this presentation, I will take you through the typical steps of a block procedure and highlight to you what I believe are key aspects to focus on and certain tips and tricks that I have found helpful in my experience. Note that I will be discussing only technical performance in this talk. However, we are clinicians, not just technicians and regional anesthesia is more than just technique. We must choose the right indications for the block, match the correct block to the surgical condition of pain syndrome, choose appropriate local anesthetic doses, and follow up the patient to ensure the absence of any complications, and most importantly, as part of a feedback loop for continual self-improvement. Setting up your environment is the first step. The priority here is to ensure that the ergonomics of block performance are optimal. Ultrasound-guided peripheral nerve blocks require complex hand-eye coordination and controlled manual dexterity, so physical comfort is important, especially for less experienced users. Consider where you will position yourself, the operator, your assistant, and the ultrasound machine in relation to the patient. Ideally, the, pa the practitioner's hands, block sight, and ultrasound screen should be in the same line of sight. Keeping the ultrasound beam and needle tip aligned while manipulating the probe and needle during advancement to the target is much more difficult if you are twisted away from the patient to look at the ultrasound screen. Decide if you will be advancing the needle along your line of sight, that is in a sagittal plane, or across your line of sight in a coronal plane. This choice is most relevant for upper limb blocks such as the axillary or infraclavicular where you have the option to stand at the head of the patient or on the same side as the limb to be blocked. There is evidence that the along approach is preferable because it is easier to achieve and maintain in-plane needle beam alignment. You can also hold a needle with your preferred hand regardless of whether the block is being performed on the patient's right or left side. The downside is that the patient's head may be in your way or you may find yourself bending over to reach the block site. The across approach may however be the most practical or unavoidable in many situations. And I have to say that we use it quite commonly in my practice. Alignment gets better with practice, but one common error I've observed in less experienced trainees is a tendency to push the needle hub away from themselves as they advance the needle or change needle angle, which misaligns the needle with the beam. The solution here is to be aware that this can happen and to check your alignment regularly by looking down at your hands away from the ultrasound screen, especially if you're having trouble locating the needle tip. It may also help to keep your elbows firmly locked into your side and not extending them. How you hold the ultrasound probe and needle is also critical for technical control. The ultrasound probe should be held low down for maximum stability and in one of two ways. If the probe is parallel to your body, then use the thumb and second and third fingers to grip the flat surface of the probe. Alternatively, hold the probe with the thumb and second and third fingers resting on the shoulders of the probe. The general rule to remember is that the wrist should not be hyperextended, which will lead to fatigue and loss of control. The finger and edge of the hand should be firmly anchored on the patient in most instances and does not move at all much during the whole procedure. The subtle tilting and sliding micro-movements of the probe required to optimize target visibility and to align beam and needle are instead made by flexing and extending the fingers. Keep the wrist in a neutral position as far as possible. The goal is to feel relaxed with no tension in the shoulders or elbows or wrist. Do not grip the probe or needle hard either. Your grip should be relaxed but controlled, which is something that comes with practice. 
Too much tension will impair your ability to make the fine movements needed for needle beam alignment, to guide the needle to the target, and to sense the tactile feedback from the needle tip as it advances through the different tissue and fascial layers. This video is a good illustration of this concept. Look at the operator's hands and note how lightly they are holding both probe and needle and the relaxed yet fine and controlled movements that each hand is making to manipulate the probe and the needle. Let's turn now to the scanning phase. This is the first step in the procedure and the goal here is to identify the nerve target on ultrasound imaging and to optimize its visibility. Anatomical knowledge is critical to ultrasound guided blocks as you will only see structures that you are looking for. But you have to know what it is that you're looking for. I hope all of you can see the fish, especially now that I've told you it's there. Ultrasound scanning for a block is also like planning a journey. The target nerve is your destination, but nerves are not always easy to see. To locate nerves, especially in patients with difficult anatomy, it's essential to know the sequence of landmarks or signposts to look for. Nerves have constant, well-defined relationships to structures that are easier to see on ultrasound. These include muscle and fascial layers, vessels, and bone. For every block, I personally have a sequence of structures that I look for that lead my eye to the nerve that I'm interested in. At the same time, I'm also aware and look out for hazards to be avoided on the way. Here are two examples of applied anatomical knowledge, both of them in the context of the ankle block. We can identify the small superficial perineal nerve by looking first for the anterior corner of the fibula and then the crural fascia that invests the leg. The superficial perineal nerve ascends to pierce the crural fascia in this location and can thus be spotted when we know where we should be looking. The tibial nerve at the ankle lies deep to an investing fascial layer. But more importantly, the nerve is located posterior and adjacent to the posterior tibial artery and accompanying veins, which are visible even in swollen ankles. And these signposts make it easier to spot the tibial nerve. But we can also optimize our ultrasound image beyond the basic adjustments with good probe handling. The two maneuvers to always use are pressure and tilting. Unlike for ultrasound-guided vascular access, in nerve blocks, we usually want to press firmly to compress the superficial tissues. This will almost always improve visibility of the target. A rule of thumb for adequate pressure is that it should be sufficient to compress any superficial veins in the area. Tilting is probably the most important maneuver for improving visibility. The echogenicity of nerves will change depending on the angle that the ultrasound waves strike the surface and return to the probe. The correct angle of tilt is determined somewhat by trial and error, but is the angle that makes the boundaries of your target, in this case the nerve, bright, clear and most visible. Occasionally, a vessel, such as the artery in an infraclavicular block, is the target of interest and in those cases, you should tilt to make that boundary clear and visible. Tilting, however, is something that many novices neglect to do, mainly because they are too tense. Learning to relax your pro grip, as previously mentioned, will assist greatly in this. Having identified your target nerve, the next step is to plan the path that your needle needs to take to safely reach the nerve for injection of local anesthetic. Using an infraclavicular block as an example, we need to get our needle tip to the 5 o'clock aspect of the artery to deposit our local anesthetic. But we need to avoid injuring nerves in the process. In particular, the lateral cord often appears to lie in the way. The solution is not to avoid the cords and to inject on the outside of the neurovascular bundle as the block will fail. Instead, we can plan a trajectory that will skim past the lateral cord and allow us to eventually get where we intend to go. Now this can be done in more than one way, but to pull it off requires that we have a deliberate consideration of where we insert our needle through the skin relative to the probe, and thus the angle that the needle will take. This example of the infraclavicular block also illustrates another important principle, and that is that with good needling technique, you can maneuver around vessels and nerves without damaging them. 
by using injected fluid to produce some hydrodissection and pushing things aside, as well as by careful handling of the blunt tip block needle. This brings us to the next phase of ultrasound guided peripheral nerve block, needling, which we will discuss further in the second part of this video series.